you to the Royal for inviting me to do this. I feel I'm taking liberties slightly by talking to you about the thing I've been most recently working on, which is a chapter for an edited collection of two volumes, ultimately, about British explorations of the Arctic in search of the Northwest Passage. So this is a book which is basically sort of exploring a whole range of aspects of British exploration in search of the Northwest Passage. For it, I'm contributing a chapter which is looking at the intervention that Jane Franklin made after her husband disappeared into the Arctic in command of a, an expedition of two ships and the admiralties have continued to search for him for a number of years. Every now and then they tried to stop the search to give up on it. Whenever they tried to give up on it, Jane Franklin urged further searches. So basically what this chapter is looking at is a particular moment at the beginning of 1854 when the admiralty was absolutely ready to give up the search and Jane Franklin made one more bid for its continuation. So that's the sort of the, the particular focus within this chapter. I'll read bits of it and I'll try to sort of talk bits of it as well. So at the beginning of 1854, the British Admiralty came to a difficult decision. Eight, indeed almost nine years earlier, on the 19th of May, 1845, two ships, the Erebus and Terror, had left the Thames under the command of Sir John Franklin to commence an Arctic voyage in search of the Northwest Passage. They had been glimpsed by whalers a couple of months later in Baffin Bay, but since then, European eyes had seen nothing of the ships or their crews. They had disappeared into a labyrinth of ice choke channels and land masses as yet unexplored and unmapped. And it was not for want of searching. Since 1848, a dozen expeditions had been conducted by land and sea in an attempt to rescue the missing men. But the searchers had found very little. Only the remains of the expedition's first winter camp on Beachy Island, which included three graves. This was forlorn proof that most of the ship's company had been alive still in the spring of 1846. But Franklin had left no information on the island, no information at the camp to show where he might have gone next. He was expecting to complete the discovery of the navigation of the Northwest Passage relatively swiftly. He was certainly not expecting anyone would be coming after him and looking for him. So in a sense, there was no particular reason why he should leave messages. But as it turned out, it was a fatal decision. So continued searches had found nothing more. They'd come in 1850, they brought back news about this one discovery which had seemed to give some hope, but nothing further had been retrieved. So in 1854, the fate of the Franklin expedition, the two ships, and more distressingly, 126 men, remained a mystery. And most people in Britain had by this time given up hope that rescue might still be possible. Almost nine years after the ships had departed, stopped with provisions for just three years, the Admiralty judged it time to call a halt. On the 20th of January, the London Gazette announced that unless news of their safety arrived before the end of March, the missing officers and men would be considered to have died in Her Majesty's service. Now, Sir James Graham, the First Lord of the Admiralty, must have felt a certain amount of nervousness when a week before the Gazette announcement, he broke the news to the commander's wife, Jane Lady Franklin. He wrote compassionately, that the decision had long been delayed out of respect for her feelings and those of all of the relatives of the deceased, but it could be delayed no longer. It was not wise, he wrote, to treat as well-founded hopes which cannot reasonably be cherished. And he offered her just one small consolation in this moment of disappointment. No wife ever made more unremitting exertions or greater personal sacrifices to afford aid to a lost husband in the last extremity of his distress. And so long as the name of Sir John Franklin will be remembered, the conduct of his wife will be remembered also as worthy of him. Now by this time in 1854, Lady Franklin was a household name because of her persistence and her very vocal persistence and insistence on the searches. She'd become the subject of popular ballads and sentimental poetry, and she was the object of frenzied effusions in the press. Sympathy for her had long fueled the public anxiety about the fate and the probable sufferings of the missing men. There was plenty of grounds for anxiety. Of course, there was a lot of public sentiment about the whole expedition, but she became the focal point of it. As the suffering wife who wouldn't give up hope, she became the focus of an awful lot of that public sympathy. And that sympathy augmented the pressure that she herself had persistently brought to bear on the Admiralty to continue the increasingly expensive search for her husband. Indeed, to tell the truth, she had made herself something of a thorn in the Admiralty's flesh. 
And yet Graham's words on this occasion were kindly enough. Perhaps he had half an eye on posterity as he sketched this innocuous portrait of a woman whose sacrifices and unremitting exertions, though above the ordinary, were fitting in the wife of a hero. And certainly the language that was used in some of the notes sort of within the Admiralty commenting on the persistence of Jane Franklin and this pestilent woman who would not go away were rather less sympathetic in their tone. So for just so long as that ill-fated officer Sir John Franklin held a place in history, Graham's patronising letter insisted, so long would his wife occupy a tiny place of her own in his shadow. Now, if Graham hoped that these gracious words would soften the fury of their recipient, he was soon disappointed. She took a fortnight to reply, and when she did, she explained that delay by reference to the shock that his letter had inflicted upon her already shattered health. One of the reproaches that Jane Franklin constantly used to the Admiralty was that they were making her ill with anxiety. Whenever bad news of any sort sort of arrived, a search failed, or the Admiralty refused to fund something, she'd take to her bed for a week or two with a nasty headache. I mean, her, her illness and her suffering were genuine, you know, insofar as one can judge historically, uh, but she certainly never hesitated to let people know about them. Uh, that was always part, you know, I've been so sick because of your terrible news. Uh, so it's part of the rhetoric that she uses. So she acknowledged the courtesy of his letter, but rather dismissively. No amount of courtesy, she said, could render his intelligence otherwise than most startling and painful. And the decision to give up on the men was, she was convinced, quite wrong-headed. She had long thought the Admiralty sluggish and ungenerous in their approach to the search. They had forced her, she often said, to amount additional small search expeditions at her own expense. And now she unleashed upon the Admiralty, or upon Graham, her bitter sense of betrayal, explicitly accusing them of negligence and obstruction. She believed that her husband might yet be living where your expeditions have never looked for him. And this was part of an ongoing thing that she always thought they were looking in the wrong place. She always had a better idea about where he might be, and she always felt that their expeditions had not been sufficiently supported or they'd been wrongly directed. He might be living where you've never looked, in a quarter where my own little vessel, the Prince Albert, which she'd at this point sent out twice, in the absence of any better means, would have endeavoured to look for him had you not denied me the means and facilities of doing so. So again, she's, she's sensing expeditions at her own expense. She's also looking continually for admiralty support with stores, with men, with money, and not always getting that, either in support of her own particular expeditions. So she acknowledged that there was very deep and painful uncertainty, as well she might, five and nine years after he disappeared, on the subject of her husband's fate. She acknowledged even that the uncertainty might well endure until the end of the natural lives of the men concerned. But she was not yet ready herself to abandon hope. One of the reasons for this was that an admiralty search was even then in progress, with instructions to examine Wellington Channel, the route that most experts agreed her husband must have taken after leaving Beachy Island. She did not expect the Admiralty to keep the case open forever, she said. She conceded that though doubt might continue till the end of the natural lives of the men, she didn't necessarily want them to keep on assuming that they were living for all of that time, which would have, of course, been decades. So she didn't expect them to keep the case open forever, but she did think they should have the decency to wait until the results of their own search were known. A month after the letter that she wrote to James Graham, Jane Franklin submitted a more formal remonstrance to the Admiralty Board. It filled 21 closely written pages. <laughs> Again, she makes reference to illness, and it was one of the reasons why it had taken time. It's also very clear she, she drafted this very, very carefully. She showed it to a lot of people. She went to a lot of care with this particular letter. Obviously, this is her last big rhetorical attempt. So she outlined four main grounds for her own continued optimism. She pointed out that the most diligent search had failed to find evidence of any catastrophe to the two ships. She pointed out, somewhat contradictorily, that the area where it was most probable that her husband's expedition had gone, though this was always a matter of speculation, had never yet been explored. She argued, on slightly dodgy scientific grounds, but she'd read a lot of books, that the resources for supporting life within the region that was unexamined were probably abundant. <coughs> there were a lot of theories about an open polar sea, about an ice barrier, which once you got beyond it, there was sort of perhaps a whole lot of further sort of natural life. So she had a vision of them sort of being shored up behind an ice barrier in a place where they could exist but not get out. And all of these things were sort of relatively well supported at the time by scientific debate. And that her husband and his officers had from the outset steadily contemplated and provided for an indefinite detention in the ice. 
On the basis of these considerations, she argued passionately that at least some members of the Franklin expedition might still be alive. And while that possibility existed, she said, the nation's obligation to the missing men could not be set aside. In the end, she's basically saying, until you know they are dead, you cannot, as a nation, give up on them. And this is the sort of the, the argument around national virtue and national honour, which in some ways sort of fascinates me most. The letter displays the deep, though always partial in both senses of the word, knowledge that Jane Franklin had by this time acquired through her intense study of Arctic geography, the course of the searches to date, and the possibilities of European survival in the ice. Jane Franklin's diaries, monumental, the papers, the archive that she generated throughout her whole life was extraordinary. She lived till into her 80s, she kept a diary for most of her life, but during the period of the Arctic searches, she didn't so much keep a personal diary, but she kept volumes of records of the Arctic searches. Every letter that she wrote, there was a copy that she kept. Every letter she received was kept. And there was an extraordinary sort of array of correspondence. When she sent private expeditions of her own, she kept records of all of the equipment and everything that had been sent with them. It's all documented. She and her niece sort of made extraordinary detailed records of everything. And of course, they were getting every book that they could lay their hands on about the Arctic, talking to everybody who'd ever been near the place, talking to everybody who'd been on a search, getting all the information they could, gathering it together, synthesizing it. And she's a very clever woman. She sort of pulls all of this information together. So she lacked practical experience, but by this time she certainly knew all of the theories about the conditions of the ice in the north, especially those such as the possibility of an open polar sea that suggested grounds for hope for her husband's expedition. She'd cogitated over his instructions and the routes he might have taken, the dangers he might have encountered and the choices he might have made. She knew in exhaustive detail where every search for him had gone, what it had accomplished and what left undone, what hindrances and obstacles had curtailed its value, what decisions and choices the leaders had faced and made. She knew the recommendations and the suggestions that every returning commander had offered about where the search should go next and the reception they had met with at home. She knew she was convinced what had been done in the search, what should have been done, and what must still be done. So her letter to the Admiralty Board was a powerful one, striking especially for its internal coherence, for the logic that made perfect sense within the circle of her own reasoning and for its command of rhetoric, and above all, for the controlled, contained anger that resonates throughout. Read on its own terms, it's remarkably persuasive. But once you get outside the flawless circle of her own logic, Jane Franklin's emphatic moral reasoning starts to look a bit dubious and indeed quite puzzling. Her insistence that this shred of hope that she was still clinging to should dictate the government's decisions was maintained in the face of the overwhelming probability of disaster the mounting costs of the searchers, and the ever-present risk to the lives of those who searched. And this was something that became increasingly apparent. The searchers themselves were all at risk. The more they discovered about the conditions of the Arctic, the more they realised how much danger they'd, Franklin and his men had been sent into. So the sense of the awareness of the hazardousness of the whole enterprise is increasingly clear. And this is one of the reasons, obviously, why there's a growing sense that more lives should not be risked in the same search. Jane Franklin's stern diatribe against the Admiralty in February 1854 in some ways marks a moment when her campaign finally lost touch with the world around her, when it slid from determination into obsession and from reason into irrationality. This apparently boundless and yet uncertainly based confidence in her own judgment has sent many historians scrambling for explanations. Most attribute her undeviating persistence to something that was intrinsic to her own personality or her psychological makeup, for good or ill. Hagiographical accounts followed hard upon the success of her campaign, representing her as a heroic example of wifely devotion. Early 20th century polar historians, while assuming that her role was peripheral always to the main action of Arctic searches, still left the image of her heroic devotion undisturbed remarking, for example, as Richard Syriax put it, that her courage and determination earned for her the respect, admiration and sympathy of all. In 1951, her biographer, Frances Woodward, introduced a slightly different note, emphasising Jane Franklin's personal claims to fame as a traveller and a diarist, and spending much more time on the life as a whole than on the, the, the Arctic period, looking at the colourful personality 
that she suggested had long been veiled under the more bland representation of Jane Franklin's wifely devotion. Partly because of Woodward's detailed research, later historians have increasingly acknowledged the extent and impact of Jane Franklin's impressive industry. Recognition of the agency of this woman, however, has not necessarily enhanced Jane Franklin's reputation. Her ability and her strength of character was visibly at odds with the popular stereotypes of Victorian femininity that she once seemed to embody. And she tends to command some perplexed admiration for this, but also to furnish rich material for satire. Pierre Burton, for example, in a book called The Arctic Grail, applauded her persistence but heaped her with adjectives that suggested he was also quietly poking fun at her every time he mentioned her. She was indomitable, indefatigable, tenacious, obstinate, peripatetic, restless. Her methods were circuitous and Byzantine. These are all Burton's words. Pondering her puzzlingly long preoccupation with her husband's fate, Burton ended up attributing it to her dominant personality. The destiny of her pliant husband he said, had been under her control in life, and it continued so in death. So she is looking after him. She's telling him what to do. So the image of the, the henpecked husband, who then conveniently dies and leaves her to sort of to reinvent. And of course, there is an element in this that's quite persuasive, but it depends very much on the image of the henpecked husband, the overbearing wife. Fergus Fleming, in another Arctic account, played up the satire, equipping Jane Franklin with a predatory hand and a gleaming eye, remorselessly extracting funds from hapless souls to support her campaigns, industriously creating opportunities for her favourites to shine in the search. Ian R. Stone abandoned the admiring tone altogether to express doubt that Lady Franklin was honest, scrupulous or principled, and to condemn her judgement as being subjective to the point of irresponsibility. In a recent biography of Jane Franklin, Ken McGugan goes further still. He presents her quest for knowledge as the deliberate creation of an Arctic legend that would fit her ambitions for her husband and herself, and it was ultimately driven by her desire for revenge upon the man who dared to tell less palatable truths about the expedition. And I think it's worth mentioning here, just by way of the, the connection to the Australian material, which was my own way into Jane Franklin originally, that when they develop these arguments about Jane Franklin as an overbearing wife, they often draw supportive material from the period that the Franklins spent in Van Diemen's land just prior to John Franklin going off on this final Arctic search. His period as governor was marked by sort of a certain amount of political weakness. He was constantly under pressure. In all of his endeavours to control the administration in Van Diemen's land, his wife was constantly by his side. Her energy, her enthusiasm for writing letters, her willingness to engage in sort of political discussion, to help him with writing dispatches, for example, all led to the building up of a growing narrative within Van Diemen's Land that she was interfering far too much in the government of Van Diemen's Land. And in the end, complaints about this getting back to England led to John Franklin being recalled on one of the grounds that was mentioned that she, was that he had allowed his wife to interfere too much in the administration. So this sort of image was already very much in place and it's there in the history in Van Diemen's Land of the overbearing wife. In my book, Savage or Civilised, which involves a number of sort of small case studies of manners in Australian society. I actually looked at Jane Franklin in Tasmania as one of the chapters and was trying to in fact suggest that there's something else going on here, not just an ambitious or overbearing woman sort of trying to regulate and control their husband's working life, but a more complicated narrative of the offence that was caused on all sides by the clash of manners as different expectations about how a lady should behave and how others should behave towards her came into conflict. And it's this sort of more textured image of the way Jane Franklin always brings values and opinions, and she certainly holds very strong values and opinions. But she then tends to get very entrenched into hostilities, antipathies, and very strong sort of arguments of her own, the more in opposition she encounters. And I think there's, there's something about the way dispute and conflict leads her to more and more unreasonable positions that one can see happening in Tasmania, and one can certainly see being played out again in this struggle over the Arctic searches. So alongside such sentimental or satirical portraits, there have been other sort of more nuanced accounts in polar scholarship, more attentive to the play of gender in Jane Franklin's activities or her public image. But to many of the scholars who explore the impact of 19th century Britain's territorial and cultural appropriation of the Arctic 
A re-examination of Jane Franklin's own personal motives in regards to the search often seems a waste of time. Here's a woman who never questioned the merits of her husband's imperialist enterprise or her own, who never challenged authority except when she thought that the people in power were not doing enough, who attended to information from Inui or from ordinary seamen only in so far as that might provide leverage for her quest. She's an elite, officer-focused British middle-class woman and she never steps really outside the assumptions that are bound up in that. Her devotion to her husband has always made her poor material for a feminist heroine. Her devotion to British Arctic enterprise is equally unattractive to those who tend to critique the insularity and the elitism of British Arctic exploration. To such writers, her motives seem neither particularly difficult nor particularly important to understand. But it's the question of her motivation that most fascinates me. I tend to seek it not, as I suggested, in her indomitable will, in her ambition or her saintly devotion, but rather in the chains of circumstances and small contexts that pushed her into increasingly intransigent positions. In these, her forceful personality undoubtedly played a big part, but her actions didn't spring forth ready-made. Throughout her long campaign, Jane Franklin responded to the actions and words of others and to the shifting circumstances of the search, responded sometimes with anger, with blame or a sense of betrayal, with flashes of hope or despair, with impatient insistence or sheer obstinacy. Her words, thoughts and actions emerged particularly in two relationships that I want to talk about in a little bit more detail. Her complicated and often bitter relationship with her stepdaughter, Eleanor Jell, and her prolonged dispute with the Admiralty itself. Both of these long-running conflicts lent energy to a wider battle that was fought out mainly in the press over the moral responsibilities of individuals and governments to history. The intricate entanglements between these different disputes ultimately enmeshed Jane Franklin in moral positions that seemed to owe little either to morality or to reason. And in some ways, the frustrations of a woman who was thrust into the public eye, who was endeavouring to deal simultaneously with a critical family and an intractable bureaucracy, fed directly into a moral drama about national responsibility and ultimately over what, in Victorian society, it actually meant to be human. So I want to look just in a little more detail at the growth of her growing hostility with the Admiralty. So from the moment in 1847 when they first reluctantly acknowledged the necessity for a relief expedition, successive laws of the Admiralty had come under public attack for their apathy and their pessimism about the search. Jane Franklin always led the charge. She knew that the searchers faced a formidable task. She pondered over and again the ambiguity of John Franklin's own instructions which left very unclear what he would do if the first plan didn't work. The first place he was told to go was obviously a not going to work, and as soon as the people started looking for him, they could see that he couldn't have done what he was told to do. But the question of what he was going to do next, you know, anything after that was left entirely to his judgment. So that was one of the problems in trying to track his path. She was also very aware of how little coastline was actually examined with the successive searches and how vast were the expanses that remained unknown because necessarily each search went over very similar ground. It took a long time to get further than anyone else had gone before. The Admiralty's bland assurances that everything possible was being done from the outset filled her with scorn and anxiety. They must do more and do it faster and this was her perpetual refrain. The urgency of the crisis, when it was already three years from the time of the expedition setting out, by the time they realised that it hadn't come back and the first searchers went out to look for them, so already they were going to be running out of stores, even if they were otherwise okay. So the urgency of this demanded the multiplication of means, she argued, and those vigorous and instant ones. As she lamented to one friend as early as 1847, everything should be done at once. It is too late for successive operations. The painful delays and frequent failures of the searchers tormented her. But as time went on and failure mounted upon failure, the words too late seemed to smack too much of despair and she struck them from her vocabulary. It would never for her be too late to make one more attempt to rescue human life. And in fact, she seems much more aware of the desperate situation the men must have been in in 1847 than she was willing to concede at any later point. So by 1851, she's writing about them as being alive and well and in good health and sort of writing of them in the present tense, where everyone around her is increasingly writing of them as being belonging to the past. And she keeps on 
talking about where they must be now. There was perhaps more of horror than of hope, I think, in this conviction that her husband and his companions might still be alive, enduring untold suffering somewhere in the icy north. It's this sense that if they were alive, they must be completely miserable and they couldn't be left in this situation. I think that's what haunts her. Rather than the hope of finding him alive, this is sort of the fear that he's not yet dead and there is still suffering going on. And in this anguished state of mind, she sought to mobilise both the nation and the international community in the cause of humanity. Surely England could not deem the question at rest, she once exclaimed, until the shores and seas of those frozen regions have been swept in all directions, or until some memorial be found to attest their fate. But the Admiralty would never sweep with the passionate commitment that she demanded. She did not trust their judgment in the searches, and nor did she trust their willingness to shoulder the necessary trouble and expense. Unless continually watched, she feared they were liable to sink into lethargy. In March 1847, they had seemed willing to do all that was necessary, but then had gone to sleep about it and had to be very plainly spoken to, she once wrote. In 1849, when she urged the Admiralty to supplement James Ross's floundering search, the first attempt to rescue the missing party, she found that they were bent on sending the cheapest ship and the cheapest men they could find. By the end of that year, her attitude was overtly antagonistic. If the great folks at the Admiralty think I am here for interfering purposes, they do my insignificance too much honour, she wrote caustically to Ross shortly after his return. I mean, what she was referring to was the fact she'd taken up residence in Spring Gardens within a bow shot of Whitehall, where she could fire off you know, <laughs> many letters a day to the Admiralty. So there's actually no question at all that she was there for interfering purposes, but she denied it. But she said, I had very zealous and very numerous friends helping my views last year, or else nothing would have been done. The Admiralty have done nothing of their own accord, but only by pressure. Their lethargy was her spur to action. She did not wish to be seen as interfering, but neither would she shelter behind an appearance of gratitude for the efforts that they made. I have found, she wrote to another friend, that it is of no use using nothing but humble and gentle words, and that even the Lords of the Admiralty are more moved by strength than by helplessness. In fact, she deployed both of these strategies as circumstances demanded, sometimes assuming a strength she did not feel, and sometimes avowing a weakness that she did not possess, as she talked about how her own humble means, her own sort of you know, pathetic dependence made her unable to carry on the search, so all her dependence was on sort of powerful men and governments. And so we come to early 1854. Under English law, a person who had not been heard of for seven years could be presumed dead. At the end of 1853, more than seven years since John Franklin's expedition had departed from its last known winter camp at Beachy Island, so even counting from the point where they were last known to have been alive, the Admiralty had law as well as pragmatism on their side when they resolved to mount no more costly searches and to place no more lives at risk on a mission so hopeless of success. Turkey was already at war with Russia and Britain's involvement in the Crimean War now seemed unavoidable. The government was no longer willing to tie up their resources of money or of men in the search for Franklin. And pay was still accumulating for the ship's companies. The Admiralty now proposed that at the end of the present financial year to hand over all monies they're owing to the men to their legal representatives and to receive claims for pensions from their widows. This was a move that represented obviously a future saving for the government as they were no longer would be responsible for the salaries but it's also worth remembering that it would offer immediate practical relief to the families of the missing men, many of whom were not in the same sort of luxurious position as Jane Franklin, who simply refused the pension and kept on living on her own independent means. For many others, grief at the loss of a breadwinner had, in some cases at least, been exacerbated by want. Public support for the searchers was certainly fading, and in some quarters, and the Times of London was particularly strong here, the voice of opposition was growing ever more vigorous. In October 1853, a budget of news from the North reached England and fuelled that opposition. One item of news was the death of the popular hero Lieutenant Joseph René Bellot, who fell through a chasm in an ice floe on which he was stranded while carrying dispatches to some of the searching ships. And this prompted the Times to lament another noble life wasted in battling with the eternal ice. And at the same time, the public learned that Robert McClure, the commander of another searching ship that had been sent out several years earlier, the investigator, had, in a fashion at least, completed a northwest passage. 
So he'd gone off supposedly looking for John Franklin. In the process, he'd got a little bit distracted by the sort of thinking that he might be able to make it through one of these channels through to, to Melville Sound and thus complete the navigation between two known bits of territory. He couldn't do it by ship in the end. His ship got stuck in the ice. He was there for two winters with his men who were practically on the point of death when one of the other searching ships coming from the other direction found a message that he had left on a sledging expedition, sent a man over across the ice, relieved the ships. They sort of staggered across. They were taken across by sledge to the other ship and loaded onto that one. So his men completed the Northwest Passage. His ship remained behind and they were very, very lucky to be alive at all. But sort of here at last, you know, there's been hundreds of years of search for the Northwest Passage. It's been a sort of elusive goal, increasingly a sort of an idealistic one. And now suddenly it's been done. And up until this time, the failure of the Franklin searchers to achieve their ostensible goal, which was to find Franklin, had been some degree compensated by the fact that they could make potential contributions to geographic knowledge, and particularly the hope that this elusive passage might be found at last. Now that hope was realised, but the discovery had proved to be of scant practical utility. So the Times argued that the horrific experiences of McClure in the pack ice added yet another and most melancholy presumption as to the fate of Franklin's expedition. And the hazardous position that he was found in suggested that the Erebus and Terror must have been hopelessly frozen up or destroyed years ago in some of the multitudinous channels that lay southwest of Melbourne Island. And surely after this, they concluded, we have now seen the last of Arctic expeditions. And up until this time, the Times had been railing against the stupidity of sending Franklin in search of the Northwest Passage at all. They said it's a completely useless thing, we don't need it. Dig a canal across the middle of America, they said. It's much more sensible. And of course, that was ultimately what was done. But, you know, let's not waste time on this quest for glory. But they had until this moment said that the humanitarian search, the search for the missing men, was something that was worth maintaining. Now, with McClure's rescue, they said there's no chance that Franklin can still be alive. And they started to talk about the quest to find him as being just as elusive, imaginary and delusionary as the quest for the Northwest Passage itself. And here they start to write very pointedly of the late John Franklin, the deceased commander of the expedition. And to paraphrase the warning that McClure had left in that case for those who might seek him, that death is the inevitable lot of the company of any ship which may be involved in the polar pack. And so when a couple of months later they announced the Admiralty's decision to declare the men officially dead, they also declared that this move could scarcely have taken even the most determined Arctic dilettante by surprise. And in fact, Jane Franklin herself had been not so much surprised as disbelieving. Friends questioned the Lords of the Admiralty on her behalf and were assured that the announcement was a mistake initially. And yet less than a month later, Graham's letter arrived confirming its truth. I suspect him, she had written of Graham himself in October 1853, in all that relates to the Arctic question. And now her worst fears were realised and she felt compelled to remonstrate. Perhaps her strongest argument was to attack the Admiralty for inconsistency, for here indeed they were on shaky ground. In 1852 they had dispatched five ships under the command of Edward Belcher on what they then proclaimed to be the last of the Arctic voyages. While the Admiralty deliberated over its options late in 1853, that final search was still underway in the Arctic, its outcome unknown at home. This didn't trouble the Times in any way. The Times simply averred that the latest expedition had always been pointless. By the time it left England, they said six years had already elapsed since anyone from Franklin's expedition was known to have been alive. To any reasonable and unprejudiced mind, they said, this had been more than sufficient for the purposes of reducing Franklin's safety to an impossibility. Instead, more men had been consigned to the ice in pursuit of an object that was well nigh visionary. But what Jane Franklin pointed out was that when they sent Belcher off, they thought there might be some chance that he would find the men alive, that he could rescue with lives. They didn't yet know that he hadn't. So they were still in the same state of ignorance as they had been when they thought it was worth sending him. Therefore, they should at least wait now until they knew that he hadn't rescued anyone before they wrote them off. She was also aware of the economic considerations that undoubtedly drove the Admiralty's thinking. She'd written to a friend that behind the hasty and indecorous act, there undoubtedly lay a motive of economy at the approach of war. But she thought it deplorable that economy should be affected by such means. And here she resorted to a, a rhetorical strategy that was one of her favourites, I think. 
So her feelings were understandably jarred by the announcement that a notional date for her husband's death should be assigned merely for bureaucratic convenience. It's this notion they're all to be dead on the 31st of March. So her response to this was to recast what was obviously in fact a practical administrative problem as a profound moral question with implications that reached far beyond her personal sufferings. No act of man's expediency, however justified as the object of it may be by considerations of economy and by critical political circumstances, can put an end to the breath of life at the end of the financial year, she declared to Graham. She believed his positive declaration to be presumptuous in the sight of God, as it will be felt to be indecorous, not to say indecent, you must pardon me for speaking the truth as I feel it, in the eyes of men. And in a lengthy remonstrance to the Admiralty, she again set the brutal bureaucratic fiction that so conveniently consigned 135 seamen in Her Majesty's service simultaneously to the grave against the higher claims of God, humanity, and the truth of her own heart. If these men had indeed died in Her Majesty's service, she thought they might have been deemed entitled to more regretful mention. But the hard official language of the Gazette notice distressed her more for its sinister implications than for the callousness of the language. Her fear was that what the Admiralty had basically given up hope. The fact they were setting a deadline at the end of March without waiting for word from Belcher's expedition, she thought would lead by too inexorable reasoning to them recalling Belcher's search itself, since they obviously no longer had any hope for it. And even if they didn't recall Belcher, she said, an unauthorised impression is produced, most discouraging and painful, tending directly to extinguish hope, to paralyse exertion, and even to suppress the expression of honest sentiment. The sentence of death that they were pronouncing here could not realise the doom of its victims, she asserted grandly. It left the truth, whatever it be, untouched. Yet it must sound on the public ear and more deeply in the ear of many heart-anxious listeners as the knell of departed hopes, the warning voice that tells us we are to prepare for the abandonment of those unhappy men to their fate. She also impugned the Admiralty's motives, condemning the unseemly haste with which they had abandoned her husband so soon after learning the news of McClure's discovery of the Northwest Passage. It was great that the Northwest Passage was being discovered, she said, through clenched teeth, one imagines, because obviously she wanted her husband to find it. But the solution of the geographical problem had apparently sealed the doom of my unfortunate husband and his brave associates, despite their self-sacrificing zeal in the same direction. And she actually wrote here, there would be a stain forever on the page of the Naval Annals of England, where these two events, the discovery of the Northwest Passage and the abandonment of Franklin and his companions, are recorded in indissoluble association. So basically she's sort of saying, you know, you really were only doing this because you were hoping for geographic discovery. Once you achieved that, you gave up on him. And finally, she sought to undercut the humanitarian argument that supported the Admiralty's position, that the government's duty of care dictated that no more lives should be risked in these futile rescue attempts. And she tried to turn the tables on the Admiralty's professed concerns for the lives that would be placed at risk by pointing out their inconsistency and indeed their injustice. No such care, she wrote, had been shown for the safety of her own husband's expedition. They went forth, my lords, at your bidding, and went to those seas which you gave them liberty to explore. You gave them no restrictions, such as have abounded in the orders of those who have gone in search of them. They were not told to spare themselves, nor enjoined to run no risks, nor restricted in time, though their mission was evidently thought to be a much shorter and much easier matter than it has proved to be. Six years of frenzied activity in the Arctic had dramatically expanded British knowledge of the dangers of the ice and the precautions and strategies they required. Lady Franklin knew that with hindsight, and especially when compared with later expeditions, her own husband's preparations and plans now looked laughably inadequate. In place of the honour of discovery, John Franklin's expedition seemed to be headed for a more dubious honour as the failure that had created the conditions for later success. At the close of 1853, Jane Franklin saw her husband's moment of glory slipping into the past before it had ever been realised. To retrieve it, she had to emphasise his role as trailblazer, to reclaim his stature as a pioneer with accomplishments to equal those of his would-be rescuers. Perhaps they had been rash, she said, to have gone without any depots behind them, without any promise of relief, without assurance of reinforcements, but this was no reason why they should now be abandoned to their fate. They had been prepared to expend themselves in a work of unknown difficulty and danger, 
and had deserved, surely I may say they have deserved of their country, that she should ascertain their fate. So one of the things I'm suggesting here is that this sort of this passionate rhetoric comes out of this long-standing enmity, a sense of frustration with the failings of the Admiralty that had been built up over a number of years, a sense that they had never taken the search seriously, that every year that one of their searches failed because of their incompetence, and she always blamed it on that, because they hadn't looked in the right place, because they hadn't put enough men or ships behind the endeavour, and so another search was needed. So she always threw the blame back on them. And at this point, she's impugning their motives on every side. She's saying, you've completely given up on something that should never have been a failure. The whole thing comes to a climax here, her sense of profound irritation of years are all expressed in this letter. But there was another and a more personal side to her optimistic stand. She'd always assumed that the government held chief responsibility for the relief of the expedition and also the best prospects of success. But for years she'd striven to supplement the Admiralty's efforts with private expeditions for which supplied both the direction and the means. And while she would have rejoiced if one of these expeditions had found the men, she did once admit that their chief benefit was applying a particular type of moral pressure on the government. Her most powerful rhetorical weapon of all was the spectacle that she herself presented to the public as a woman struggling to accomplish with her own humble means and feeble abilities projects that the Admiralty could and therefore should have managed with economy and ease. The Admiralty had been forced into action, she declared, when the public saw me struggling so hard to supply their deficiencies. And this was accompanied by a highly self-conscious performance of sacrifice. One of the things that was repeatedly said about her in the papers was that how much she had sacrificed every scrap of money that she could. Everything she had was poured into the searches. She just secured a small amount of income for herself. The rest of it, you know, she lived as cheaply as possible. She curtailed her expenditure everywhere in order to carry succour to the Arctic expedition. And her continued sacrifice and privation was something that therefore required the chivalry of the nation, the chivalry of men to assist her in her quest. And of course, a woman living in a state of poverty in order to finance these small heartfelt ventures to save her husband's life was almost guaranteed sympathy and admiration in the Victorian age. But that's the public rhetoric. Up close, this selflessness could take on a very different appearance, and both the rightness of her actions and her right to carry them out constantly came under dispute. People who knew and loved her were really actually quite irritated by the fact she was giving up all of her income, and that any money that came to her was going to go straight into searches, which increasingly even her closest family members are seeing as unlikely to be successful. So they're basically seeing her throwing money away. And it was most apparent that this level of concern was perhaps most apparent when her father died in his 90s. And just before he died, he had changed his will, leaving all of his fortune to a grandson and not leaving her the third of the fortune that shared between her sisters that she was expecting to come to her. And she always denied emphatically that this had anything to do with him not wanting her to waste his money on further searches, but it's really difficult to see what else he was thinking. And even the emphaticness of you know, her protests rings rather hollow. So there's a general sort of dislike of this sacrifice, but there's also a very particular context, which is that the money that she was spending, a lot of it was arguably not hers at all. Her husband had a daughter by a previous marriage and much of his fortune had come from his first wife. He had a life interest in it, but once he was dead, it descended to his daughter. The fact that Jane Franklin refused to accept that her husband was dead, refused therefore to have his will read, meant that she had command of a whole lot of money, which Eleanor thought was hers. And Eleanor, after the failure of the first round of searches, by the beginning of 1849, Eleanor had pretty much said we should not be doing any more, and she was always opposed to Jane Franklin's private expeditions, to the throwing away of, of private money on ventures that she said could never be of any use. She was happy to accept, you know, the help of the government, but she didn't think that any individual enterprise was worth it, and she obviously was particularly upset to see her own fortune being frittered away in this way. It's a little more complicated than that because Jane Franklin always made her an allowance, but this contest over money was absolutely at the heart of things. But there's also a sort of a deeper context here of the difficult relationship that had always existed between Jane Franklin and her stepdaughter. As a teenager, 
Eleanor's position in her father's household had been threatened by the presence of an older cousin who, when the Franklins went to Van Diemen's Land in 1836, joined the Franklins' household and quite soon seemed to surpass Eleanor in Jane's regard. This was Sophia Craycroft, who throughout the, the period of the Arctic searches took up residence with Jane Franklin, sort of as her favoured niece, was always her supporter and disciple, helped her with everything, sided with her in every dispute, and clearly regarded Eleanor with a sense of intense sibling rivalry, which Eleanor reciprocated in full. For example, in 1850, Jane Franklin describes Sophie in one of the forlornly hopeful letters that she sent for her missing husband as the kindest of daughters to me, counting Eleanor out as a daughter and sort of, you know, placing Sophie in that role. Sophie was no doubt right to believe that Eleanor resented the confidence and companionship that existed between us. And the tension was exacerbated further by the fact that Eleanor was engaged when her father went away, that he had said, don't get married till I come back that in 1849, after the failure of the first round of searches, Jane Franklin was still saying, I think you should wait. Eleanor decided to marry anyway. She was of age and she could. But this was a total rift between the two of them. And the intensity of this sort of personal conflict was something that, that dogged the whole family, I think, throughout the whole period. So there's money and peace of mind at stake for Eleanor. But there was also, I think, a sense of continuing concern on the part of Eleanor and her husband for what was going on for Jane. I mean, like the rest of the family who saw her throwing money away, they saw these qualities of optimism and determined self-sacrifice that were so publicly lauded in Jane Franklin as making her disturbingly vulnerable to exploitation. She was hungry for any hopeful account of her husband's chances, and in that hunger she surrendered her capacity for judgment. She would pursue any source of information, however dubious, and she seemed willing to sink her fortune into any proposal for rescue, however implausible, and some of them were very implausible. John Philip Jell, Eleanor's husband, once wrote to the Times that she had thus fallen prey to the wild schemes of needy and unprincipled adventurers who have made their account in practicing upon her passions and feelings. Jane Franklin, or one of her supporters, retorted that the heroic enterprises of honorable, gallant, and good men did not merit this criticism. But there seems no doubt that she was indeed the target of opportunists. Lady Franklin's efforts and expenditures defied any rational calculation of costs and benefits. Believing that she had a sacred trust to rescue her husband, she counted no cost to herself in the pursuit of what even she acknowledged was a diminishing hope. The problem was that she counted no cost to others either, and was made ill with anxiety and disappointment when they failed to live up to her standards. What was not freely offered, she lamented, demanded or simply took. With a growing family and no hope in their own hearts that John Franklin might have survived, the Gels were indignant witnesses and unwilling and outraged accessories to Jane Franklin's virtuous sacrifice. And they suffered the added indignity of being reviled by Jane Franklin's supporters, Sophie Craycroft, chief among them, for their selfishness. Up until the end of 1853, when a chorus of friends and family members pressed her to accept the reality of her husband's death, Jane Franklin found support for her own position in the fact that the Admiralty officially recognised him as living and still continued to seek the expedition. In November of 1853, Sophie Craycroft was writing indignantly of the Gell's iniquitous attempt to take premature possession of an inheritance that would only become theirs on the death of my uncle. She added that, of course, Jane Franklin would not keep the inheritance from them indefinitely, though she could have done. She protested against it only so long as his name remains on the books of the Admiralty, which must be while Admiralty expeditions are in search of the party. And so the decision that was announced in January 1854 that the Admiralty would no longer count the men as alive had personal, serious personal, as well as public repercussions. And it's even so, she would not abandon her protest against Eleanor's quest to have the will read. And perhaps by then she could not. And I think this is the point I'll sort of finish on. It was not that she didn't wish to give up her income to Eleanor and not even that her intransigence had been deepened by hostility, though these were both factors, but that Jane Franklin and Sophie Krakoff had learned to measure the good feeling and good sense of all around them by their faith in what they called the cause. Despair would undermine the cause. Anyone who thought John Franklin was dead and therefore didn't look for him was, in a sense, in their view, was going to kill him by failing to, to continue the search. They were sternly unforgiving of any lapse of confidence in others and allowed no scope, therefore, for their own confidence to fade over time. They made faith in the possibility of the expedition's survival, the hallmark of their own superior loyalty, so much so that the only acceptable response to every disappointment was renewal of effort. 
Small wonder then that Lady Franklin would not allow the Admiralty's pragmatism in January 1854 to bring her own efforts to a natural close. She was locked in a numbing, repetitive cycle that blocked out altogether the voice of reasonable despondency. Okay, I'll stop there and <laughs> leave a couple of minutes at least for questions. Yeah. Just one little question, and it was prior to 1854, mm. actually. There was a, um, a small balloon found with um, coordinates in someone's backyard. Was uh, Jane Franklin the cause of that, or was it uh, another attempt to get money from her? To be honest, I'm not sure I know the balloon story. <laughs> um, oh, I know there was, there were, it was yeah. one of the rescue balloons um, yeah. that had been yeah. widely distributed to a number of people. Yes, there, there were so many rumours, and there was so much written about all of them, that I can't call the particular one to mind. I know there was, at one stage, a bottle was found with you know the ship's position, but it turned out that it had been obviously been cast overboard in the first year. And I know there were a number of plans to search with balloons, or at least you know, sort of <laughs> so all sorts of sort of wild schemes that were, were put forward. But I'm, I'm afraid I don't know about the balloon itself. Okay. But you know, it could have been a publicity stunt. I mean, that was the other thing. There was a lot of talk yeah. and, and rumour that circulated. It was because it was the same balloon, one of the same balloons that Lady Jane had as well. She had in right. her possession. Yeah. Okay. I I'll have to, I'll have to follow that story out. up. The whole notion of polar exploration was of European supremacy over the wilds, the wilderness, etc. often forgetting, particularly in, well, obviously in the case of the Arctic, that the Inuit were living there, had colonised it, etc. And I'm curious, although I think I do know the answer, but I'm curious as to whether or not anyone thought to ask the Inuit, did they know what had happened to the Franklin expedition? And the answer is, yes, they did. And such questions were always hampered by the difficulties of translation, but also by you know, the absence of direct knowledge. So there's, there had been a case in 1849 when a whaler returned with a map that he'd got from the Inuit, which, which purported to show both James Ross's searching ships and John Franklin's ships sort of in communication with each other. The map sort of you know, generated an awful lot of discussion at home about how reliable it might be. Jane Franklin wanted to rely on it because she always wanted to rely on anything that offered hope. But it was discredited quite quickly by the fact that James Ross returned within a few weeks and obviously had not at any point been in contact with Franklin and had not been anywhere near where he was meant to have been. And the question of how reliable those reports were was something that was always under contest. Jane Franklin, I think, was always expedient in her response to such information. If it suited her stories and it suited her hopes, then she would rely on it. But when stories of catastrophe were brought back, there was one that Adam Beck told John Ross that the ships had actually founded before they even went into the ice. And that story she always dismissed as being sort of completely without foundation. And classically, Jane Franklin's protests in 1854 didn't have much effect, but later in the year, John Ray, Hudson's Bay trader, sort of returned to England with the story that there came in the end, you know, was the more conclusive one, that the ships had been somewhere far from where they'd been looked for, and that Inuit had seen men sort of trying to escape overland from the ships and ultimately dying of starvation. That story she accepted and used as a basis for suggesting that further searches should be directed now that they knew where the ships were, even though no one was still alive. She tended to discredit the other element of that story, which was that the men had eaten each other before they died, you know, that there was cannibalism in the last days of the expedition, and that was something, a story that she was never willing to entertain. Some historians have seen that's the desire to suppress that story as driving her motivation over the last few years. I think I see her as already locked into a position where she could never give up where knowledge was absolutely required and the momentum of, of her campaign was already well in place before that last story came back. But yes, I mean that sense of the, the Inuit testimony was only as valid as you know, what people wanted to believe and it was always sort of instrumental. And actually it was a, a conference the other week where someone was actually talking about this and saying that of course, and it's still that, that testimony is now being subjected to continual critical review as though somehow it does contain the clues and the truth. 
but it's not something that they could have known. They were no, never in the area where the ship was. It was only ever by sort of by hearsay and chance encounters. They didn't have any privileged knowledge, in fact. People wanted them to, and historians still want that knowledge in some way to be more reliable or containing some truth that is still a bit elusive. But the reality is probably that it, you know, their stories were just as partial as anyone else's. So it's, it's, but it is an interesting question. Thank you.